And so I get through my, my dissertation, if you will, and the guy, he's, he's like sitting on the edge of his seat, and he, he, like he can't wait to pray. And in fact, I mean, it, you know, would you, like to, would you like to pray to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today? Boom, yes, absolutely. He prayed quick, fast, and in a hurry. Like, almost like hell's doors had opened up behind him, and he was running. And I'm, I, and I'm sitting there, I'm, in, I'm enjoying it. Amen, this is good. And the lady, though, his wife, she sat back, kind of reserved. And she didn't, she didn't pray to accept Christ. She wasn't, she wasn't ready to accept Christ as her Lord and Savior. She recognized that she had sinned. She recognized that apart from a Savior that God had provided, that there was no way for her to make it to heaven. But I'll never forget what she said. She looked me straight in the eye, and she said, I'm a nurse. And I can tell you, dead people don't get back up. I was flabbergasted. So I went into, you know, a, a few different things about, you know, well, what do you think happened? And, and we're going to touch on that in a minute. But ultimately, she left that day without having accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior. Now, it did happen later on in the week that God provided someone else from the ministry that uh, could maybe frame things in a different way for her and... And, and prayerfully, what I, I, what I pray is that, that it began working on her heart and she realized that, you know what, God is God and He can do what He wants. He doesn't have to ask permission to, to get somebody up out of the grave. And, and so, ultimately, that week she did, later that week, she did give her life to Christ. And, and I'm, I'm thankful for it. But her situation isn't isn't terribly uncommon. I have some Muslim friends that will tell you that no, Jesus, the, the, this resurrection thing, this is, this is not true. They'll say that, and they do say, that it was not actually Jesus who died on the cross. They call him Issa. Issa did not die on a cross, they would tell you. Allah, God, who they call God, Allah, substituted somebody else, put somebody else up on the cross and killed that person to fool the Jews. Now my problem, and they, they even theorized that it could have been Judas Iscariot. My problem with that is that if, if Issa, or Jesus, in their Quran is a prophet, well, Jesus, remember, he is risen as he said. He told us. He told the people before. I'll destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll rebuild it. They thought that he meant Herod's temple, or Zerubbabel's temple, at that, by that time. But he really meant, no, I was right, Herod's temple. But he really meant himself, that he would be in the ground, and that on the third day, he would, he would come out. So either Jesus lied, which means he's not a prophet, or Jesus told the truth. Either way, the Quran is wrong. Jesus can't be both a prophet and a liar. And further, if Allah did this to fool the Jews, even if we allow that it could have been to protect Jesus from harm, here's the problem. We have all these Jews and Gentiles since then that have believed that lie. And according to the Quran, we're destined for the seventh and eighth levels of hell or sixth and seventh levels of hell I really forget which but either way 
we're, we're headed for doom because we believe the lie that he told. So what kind of God is that? I would submit no God at all. My God is not a man who can lie. Amen. And so with that, it, it's, it's important that we, that we recognize this because if Jesus isn't risen, then he isn't the God that we worship. He's not the God that the Bible speaks about. Uh, many skeptics will tell you, they'll, they'll allow that Jesus died on the cross, or that he went to the cross, that he wasn't substituted, that he went to the cross. Some will say that Jesus' body was stolen by the disciples. In fact, that's even in Scripture, that, that the Jewish leadership said, look, don't, don't worry, you know, to the soldiers who passed out, and don't worry about it. We'll tell them, you go and tell him that the disciples stole the body, and we'll cover for you. We'll make it good. It's okay. Here's the problem. The night that Jesus was arrested, what happened? The disciples fled. One of them fled, ran away naked. He was so scared. Dropped his clothes and all, and took off, cutting out through the woods without a stitch. Ray Stevens might say with nothing but a frown because, you know, he wasn't smiling. So, what do we do with that? Do we believe that these, that these disciples who were not fighters but fishermen went and overtook these trained, armed Roman soldiers and stole the body and then later went to their death all but one, all but John, died proclaiming that they had seen the risen Lord, that they had touched him, that they had eaten with him, that, that, they, that they were telling the truth, that this was not some kind of hallucination, that he was risen, as he said. So here's the thing. All they had to do was tell the truth, and then they wouldn't be killed. We see people who are willing to die for what they believe. Let's face it, that's not just a, a, a... When I've shared this in the past, some people have said, yeah, the Muslims will blow themselves up to, in, a, in, in an attempt to get to uh, paradise and 72 Vestal Virgins and so on, and that's wonderful. And, but the fact is that we Americans, we'll die for what we believe. People, people go and lay down their lives for what we believe all the time. But would you die for a lie? Would you die for something you knew was not true? I submit that you would not. I submit that on the torturer's rack, that you would say, okay, I'm sorry, I was lying. I give up. I was lying. But they didn't. And they knew whether what they were saying or not, what, what they were saying was true or not. It wasn't a matter of what they believed. It was what they knew. So no, the idea that the disciples stole the body doesn't hold water. Now maybe the Jews or the Romans stole the body, but that doesn't hold water either because as soon as these kooky Christians came up and started saying, he's risen, he's risen, like he said, then what would happen? We would have the Jews, Jewish leadership, or the Roman leadership. Put that down quick, fast, and in a hurry, here's his corpse. They didn't have any respect for, for people's corpse. Here's his corpse. He's not dead. He, he's not risen. He's dead. He's still dead and beginning to stink. But they didn't do that. Why? Because the body wasn't there. The morning that they showed up at the tomb, the body was gone. This is pivotal. This is absolutely key. Here's the thing, and I, I, used to, I used to use this back, back in the day. I would, I would suggest that maybe Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He, he had lost a lot of blood. Maybe he just passed out, you know, and then they put him in the tomb, and in, the, in that cold tomb, he woke up. He revived. He, he, he just swooned. In fact, they call it the swoon theory. And then he woke up. One of, uh, 
one of my favorite skeptics, David Hume, actually tore that argument up better than I think anyone possibly could. He said that basically to believe that, what you have to believe is that these Roman soldiers who had trained and whose very lives depended on knowing whether or not the person on the cross was dead. Because if they, if they flubbed once, they went to their death. That was it. They were going to be put down. So, these Roman soldiers mistakenly missed one out of all the many thousands that were crucified. They missed one, Jesus. Well, you know, they didn't break his legs on the, on the cross. You know, they, oh yeah, he's already dead. But what did they do? They punched, punctured him in the side. They, they thrust a spear into his side and, 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 and pierced the pericardial sac. I, I, I don't know if that's the right word. You, you medical types will, will certainly set me straight. But the, the pericardium, I believe is what it is, the sac around the heart, uh, issued forth blood and water. Or what looked like water. And they knew he was dead. There was no doubt about it. But let's say, let's just say that they, that even after all that, that somehow he, he lived and with holes in his hands and feet and head and side and his back opened up by the Roman scourges, that he somehow mustered the strength to roll this huge stone away from the tomb. And then he opened up a can, well we can't say that, he overcame the soldiers, the trained armed soldiers, beat them down, and then walking through Jerusalem during the Passover, a time where the, the city was so swollen that, that one of the one of the, the gospel writers says that that the, the cop crew twice, the, the cop crew meaning the, the, the night watch, that he, he the, the, the city was so full that he had, to, he had to give the time and all is well in one direction and the time and all is well in the other direction because the city was so full of people. So at a time when, when Jerusalem was more like Times Square on New Year's, we see Jesus walking through the, the town, leading from his head, hands, feet, and side, and back. And nobody notices. We see him arrive at the doorstep of his disciples and say, here I am, look at me. This is the hope of your glorification. This is what your glorified body is going to be like. See, I told you I'd rise from the dead. Be serious. David Hume put it that that, that, was, that was absurd to the utmost degree, and, and I agree with him. Um, so what do you do with the empty tomb? You can only go by what the scripture says.